Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is confused by the latest health study as I am by why it is that I am here in the studio all by myself today. I am Matt Fox, Professor of Epidemiology and Global Health. I am typically joined in the studio by Chris Gill from the Department of Global Health and Don Thea, also from the Department of Global Health. But it is summertime here in the United States, and people are away. And it's also our one-year anniversary. So it has now been one year since we started this podcast. And it has turned out way better than we ever imagined. We uh, just checked. We have over 23,000 downloads of, of episodes of the podcast. And we have been downloaded in over 90 countries. It's truly been a, an amazing experience for us. And therefore, we wanted to take some time in this episode to reflect back on some of our favorite amazing and amusing uh, segments from the past year, because of course those are, are our favorite parts of the show. So we put together this uh, compilation of some of what we think of as our greatest hits, and we really hope you'll enjoy them. Um, before we get into it, I do just want to ask you once again to uh, give us a, a rating on, on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. It really helps us to spread the word about the show. So as we said, Today we are going to focus on some of our favorite of the amazing and amusings that uh, we have done over the past year, and we're going to break it down into three sections, one, one for some of our favorites from each of the three of us that we have done in, the, in previous episodes, and we'll start off with some uh, insights from Don Thea that, as longtime listeners of the show will know, absolutely uh, cracked me up. Don uh, is the one who came up with the idea for the Amazing and Amusing, and he still to this day refuses to call it the Amazing and Amusing. He calls it the Wacky Science section. But uh, as, you will, uh, as you will know from listening to the show, Don tends to find some of the craziest studies that are out there. He's a particularly big fan of, as he's mentioned on the show before, the Ig Nobel Awards, but also seems to find things that never made it into the Ig Nobles that are absolutely hilarious. So here are some of our favorites from Don. Um, again, I'm going to dip into the well of the University of Leicester in, uh, in England to talk about um, some of the physics yes. reports yes. that um, have been published in their journal, which is the Journal of Physics Special, uh, um, physics special Topics. And I really recommend that the listener go to I that website uh, and look at some of these papers that have, have been reported. I usually see people reading that on the beach. I'm yeah. sure you do. Yeah. Um, so the first one I wanted to report to on was um, Indiana Jones and the <laughs> Fridge to Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> the, the bridge the to fridge. freedom. Not right. the bridge, the fridge. So Mansfield, Willis, Doggett, and Coley reported in 2016 um, – a paper that investigates the plausibility of Indiana Jones being able to survive the initial gamma ray radiation from a nuclear explosion by containing himself within a lead-lined fridge. Wait, wait. As you remember, so Indiana, many questions. in the 2008 so many questions. film... Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of Crystal Skull, Indiana is uh, oh, Crystal see, I, Skull. Indiana is left stranded in a nuclear test town. I didn't see it. He is seemingly doomed to certain death as the nuclear bomb is activated and the siren begins to count down. With literally seconds to spare, he's able to squeeze himself into a lead-lined fridge, surviving the explosion and aftermath without mm -hmm. any noticeable injuries. Sounds about right. In this paper, they explore the plausibility of Indiana being able to survive this event by investigating how thick the lead within the fridge would need to be, such that the initial gamma radiation given off by the bomb is no longer harmful to Indiana. Hmm. And hmm. they go through this exhaustive and description. The conclusion. And the conclusion is... Therefore, we conclude that it is unlikely Indiana would have remained unharmed from the gamma radiation as the minimum thickness of lead needed is 4.58 centimeters, which is likely to be greater than the thickness of the lead lining within the fridge. He may, however, have been able to survive the gamma radiation if the whole fridge was made from lead as mm. opposed to just lead lined. Mm. It is unknown exactly what this thickness of the fridge is. All aspects considered, however, he would have almost certainly been killed by being caught up within the blast of the bomb with the fridge being subject to an enormous amount of force. Wouldn't so this, however, it cannot be further investigated. So many questions come to mind. <laughs> wouldn't, the, wouldn't the fridge of the lead have melted? You would think. 
So many questions. So again, I want to make a plug for for this particular course at the University of Leicester. I think they have done a fabulous job at getting these physics undergraduate physics majors interested in real world problems. So yep. question one. Whatever happened to willing suspension of disbelief? And <laughs> can I now publish a scientific article which cites the willing suspension of disbelief at the beginning? <laughs> Question two, did my tax dollars pay for that? No, this is England. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, the, the, the students' tuitions paid for this. Oh, excellent. And these are all thought experiments. I mean, there's nothing other than Oh, I see. Student... This is, there's no one collecting. They didn't actually put... No. Indiana Jones no, in no. Uh, lead. No, they just do physics calculations to Got determine. It. They make assumptions about how thick the lining would be, how big the refrigerator is. Got it. So Got it. nuclear bombs on the Isle of Wight. Got it. The three of us had talked at some point about um, doing uh, in these podcasts a review of our own papers. Yes, we did. So we I are going to do that at some point. So I thought it would be appropriate to actually introduce a paper that one of us has, oh, yes. has created. I and, have to guess who. And the, I can and guess the name who. Of this I paper, know exactly who it is. The name of this paper is Gustatory Preferences for Marmite versus Vegemite Among <laughs> Americans. This is my finest paper. Published in the Journal of Irreproducible Results. Yes, one of the, one of the proudest by findings. By Christopher Gill and Paul Bolton. And so... The premise for this study is to try to figure out, try to um, resolve this ongoing debate that has occurred amongst countries that are co- uh, in the Commonwealth. Going back to... In, going back to 1905, I think, when Marmite was first created. Got it. Um, to try to resolve which is better. And it's important to know that Chris Gill has an association. You were brought up in, in UK? Or you I, have I was born there, but I, lived, I grew there. up here. But you have this very, very strong affinity I've been, I've been for the UK. eating Marmite since I was a baby, yes. Right. Oh. And the other author was, was Paul Bolton, who was a faculty member um, in our department, and he was Australian. And so they would have these raging debates during lunch or well, he during just wouldn't our faculty listen to reason. He wouldn't listen to reason. And so they both decided that the only way for our Australian to, res- listeners. <laughs> to resolve this issue was to run a side-by-side comparison among the faculty in our department, full which they did. Full disclosure, were you involved in this trial I in any way? I was involved. I was one of the subjects as, of yeah. this as study. As was I. And so what, what they did is they set this up as a side-by-side Blinded trial with little squares of toast. Blinded, on, on, blinded because you go blind after on, you eat this stuff. On which was spread either a Vegemite or Marmite. Oh, and they had, butter. there was a quantitative and a qualitative aspect to the study. And the quantitative aspect, essentially the bottom line was that they are both all disgusted. of the Americans could not discern a difference between <laughs> Vegemite and Marmite. And all of the Americans found them equally disgusting. Yes, that <laughs> and, is so right. And there, there was a scale that was used um, for figuring out uh, what the quality of the appearance, smell, taste, and after flavor of Marmite and Vegemite Spelt were. Spelt with British spelling. And it well went, done. for appearance, it went Didn't from enticing to induces a fight or flight response. Yep. The smell was deliciously aromatic or worse than smelling salts. That sounds right. For taste, right. it was mighty good versus emetogenic, which means it induces I vomiting. Don't know what that, oh, okay. There after you go. flavor was tantric ecstasy versus <laughs> like something died in your mouth. I go with the, with the last <laughs> so, one. Anyway, oh, and then there, was another, with this one. there was another scale which went from god awful ferment of the bounties bilge what? like arthropod jelly on toast, <laughs> concentrated <laughs> pond scum, miasmic effluent, or nectar of the gods ambrosia. I can tell you it's not that last one. <laughs> so I was Ooh. so, I, I thought this was a brilliant piece of work and I thought it was, well done, Chris. It was really pushing the barriers far. About but spill. then then I went into the literature and I found out that there are Apparently, 75 other comparison trials between Marmite and wow. Vegemite. And in fact, there's apparently, there's also a New Zealand version of Marmite. And really? when, yes, when the really. New Zealand earthquake happened in Christchurch, the factory that makes the New Zealand Marmite closed down oh. and the people in New Zealand apparently freaked out when they called it Marmageddon. <laughs> Apparently, like Marmite it. is the world's most polarizing spread. But yep. the most interesting thing that I want to point out is that there is a Marmite gene project where an organ- a specialist genetics company called DNA Fit has determined 
what is the genetic predisposition of whether you love or you oh, hate? Oh come on! Marmite? This is like the the anosmia. And apparently they have looked they've looked at um, single nucleotide polymorphisms and they've associated it with whether you are a marmite You've lover be or hater. And so Americans don't have that. And it turns out Americans that, are that you can for for eighty nine pounds you can get your gene, um, your your genetic makeup. To, um, sent in, yep. and they will determine whether you are a lover or a hater. And what they say <laughs> is that it turns out that preference for Marmite is genetically predisposed. And the, the, the report that they put out say, it, uh, secondly, Roos explains in a, in, in, with some serious, quote, that lovers and haters can coexist in the same family. Really? Even if two parents are haters, they can still have a love child. Oh, <laughs> that is just terrible. Well, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. And did you, and did you it know was that, a brilliant piece of work, Dr. Gill. Thank well you. done. Did, did you know that the prime minister of, of, um, of New Zealand, when that earthquake came and, and destroyed the Marmite factory, went on the, on the radio and said, do not panic. We will import <laughs> Marmite supplies to keep you going. You will not have to eat Vegemite. Oh, that is scary. All right. All right. So um, I'm going to um, go from the sublime to the probably ridiculous. Um, I also pulled an article from the BMJ Christmas Excellent. edition, but this is from 2008. And the title of this article is Head and Neck Injury Risks in Heavy Metal. Headbangers stuck between <laughs> rock and a hard base. Oh, oh yes. No. <laughs> sure, sure. Sure, sure. So apparently there's this phenomenon that started with the first national tour of Led Zeppelin in 1968 in Boston. Okay. When um, the audience was noted to synchronously be banging their heads on the stage. Mm -hmm. And from that has evolved this convention in heavy metal band concerts of headbanging. Mm -hmm. And apparently there are a whole different set of ways in which one can headbang. Now, it doesn't always Makes mean sense. that you come in contact with a, you know, with a stationary object, but a lot of the band members, as well as the audience, will do this headbanging, sure. which is... Which Chris a, is a, a, uh, doing right now. There are several types. There's the um, up-down, uh -huh. side-to-side, no. and then <laughs> circular headbanging. What? Yeah. Um, I only know about the up down. So, I like to show, throw my hair around right so, so, so this article by Chris Declan Paul, for anyone who doesn't know Declan Patton and Andrew McIntosh, <laughs> who are who are uh, I think that they are specialties biomechanics. And so what they did is they did a study where they went out um, and observed a whole bunch of different kinds of heavy metal bands, identified what was the most prevalent kind, type of headbanging, which was up and down it headbanging. Definitely is up and down. They Everybody then, knows that. They then in a biomechanical way, wrote a model to determine what was the level of head injury based on the angle of the head banging and the tempo of the music. Oh, yeah. Wow. And so they, they, they built these models so that they could predict the amount of, uh, of uh, damage that could potentially be done given a particular song or a particular, um, a, a particular tempo. And one of the things that they they did an observational study. Apparently, they attended Motorhead, Motley Crue, Skid Row, and White Snake concerts. Ooh, some of my favorites. Uh, they um, uh, tried to determine what was the maximum angle and um, uh, beats per Amplitude. minute, the angles of headbanging, and Frequency, beats per minute yeah. that would that would confer the the most damage. Um, and they had ten. Please say Motley Crue. They had please, say Motley Crue. please say Motley Crue. Ten musicians were asked to, to um, nominate the ten best headbanging songs, oh, <laughs> and they put in, they put in parentheses musical training or talent was not a prerequisite for participation good, 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 good. in that. Uh, so the average tempo for heavy metal is 146 beats per minute, but there are some bands like Motley Crue, Kickstart My Go Heart, Motley Crue, that play at 180 beats per minute. Wow! With a uh, so that they Presto. determined that a range of motion needs to be below 45 degrees to avoid head head injury. Oh, so, so they come up with a bunch of prescriptions for how one might be able to reduce the likelihood of injury when you were attending your next metal band um, concert. Fantastic. And so they, and then they suggest some interventions and the possible interventions to reduce the risk of injury caused by headbanging include limiting the range of neck motion through a formal training program <laughs> delivered before, <laughs> before a concert. I'd attend. I'd definitely attend. S substitution of adult-oriented rock and easy listening Definitely <laughs> music. not. That's out. Uh, including Michael Bolton and Celine Oh, my Dion. God. 
My God, Kenny that would G. be terrible. Get some Kenny G uh, going. Or, or uh, uh, the use of personal protective equipment, such yes. as neck braces, to limit the range of motion. You would definitely motion. be cool if you wore a neck brace to the Motley Crue concert. <laughs> <laughs> future, that is for sure. Future research will involve neuropsychological testing so smart. of concert goers to so validate smart. the modeling presented in this paper. That's I think so, I was... I think very I was, practical. Ten years old when I won a, a Motley Crue T-shirt. Did you go? At the, uh, no, no, at the at the, the town uh, town carnival, and I I wore that thing to death. Pretended I went. I didn't actually go. After after two two uh, articles of such erudition, uh-huh. I, I I feel like I I need to bring the bar. Which bodily down. function are we going to talk about today, Don? <laughs> a little lower. <laughs> No, this is not a bodily function. So okay. what I'm going to do is I'm going to... You have a phone out. Are you going to play something for no, us? No, I just forgot the oh, okay, reference, great. so I just need to read the reference off my phone. But um, Happy no, this is an article that I found from the psychology literature. Oh, well done. Your domain, Matt. Um, Francis T. McAndrew and Sarah Kenke um, in New Ideas in Psychology published a paper on the nature of creepiness. Oh, yeah. Mm. On the nature of creepiness. Right. So they're, they're saying that, you know, the, the perception of creepiness is pervasive in a lot of different cultures. Yeah. Um, but there's no I'm creepiness some construct. Of it right in this room. There's no creepiness construct. We don't really know how to define creepiness. We don't. And what goes into the definition of creepiness? Why would one person perceive something as creepy and the other person wouldn't? I don't know. They they said there's no prior research. Therefore, this is a study exploratory in nature. They did snowball sampling through invitations to Facebook events created by researchers aimed at student faculty and staff at liberal arts colleges in the Midwest. And they posed a question to the, uh, the subjects, which was, imagine a close friend of yours whose judgment you trust. Now imagine that this friend tells you that she or he just met someone for the first time and tells you that the person was creepy. And they asked a series of questions um, with respect to different pat- – they, they uh, asked 44 different patterns of behavior, 21 different occupations, and a list of hobbies that people thought might be oh, creepy. Oh, associated with this person? That, that they – yeah, that this person would admit to would that they it, thought yeah. was creepy. Um, and so 95% thought that um, – creepiness was more likely to be associated with male gender Mm -hmm. than female gender. And that's both the men and the women. That sounds right. Um, And, and probably the one that is at the top of the list is steering the conversation towards sex. (laughs) was was considered to be creepy on the, on first meeting this person. But the other characteristics were that the person stood too close. Yeah. That's creepy. The person had greasy hair. Oh yeah. Had a peculiar smile. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. bulging eyes and long fingers. Kind of like Un- Nosferatu. Yeah, kind of. Uh, unkempt hair, very pale skin, dressed oddly, and licked his or her lips frequently. Yeah, that always weirds me out when people do that. Um, and then I, feel like, I feel like I'm 50-50 on this list. Yeah, it could be. Um, the person would laugh at unpredictable times. And then as far as hobbies... <laughs> as far as hobbies were concerned... It was. <laughs> that does seem to be a theme through all these podcasts. It I don't does. know what you mean, Don. Yeah. Uh, the hobbies that were considered to be creepy were collecting hobbies, in particular, if a person admitted to collecting dolls, insects, oh, reptiles, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or body parts. Such what as, now? Such as teeth, bones, or fingernails oh, were ex- considered to be especially creepy. creepy. Um, and the second most frequently mentioned creepy hobby, hobby involves some variation of watching, following, or taking pictures of people, especially children. Yeah, that's was thought to be creepy. That that creepy. And bird watchers, of all things, were considered creepy by many as well. Bird watchers. Bird watchers. Now, weird. Like, where would people be that they would see bird watchers and be creeped out by that? Or is it that there are people with big cameras hiding in the woods? I guess. What are they doing? You know, they're just like so, looking at, at birds in the trees. During mating season, I don't know. A lot of that rings true, and a lot of that makes me think I should go and reevaluate my own behavior. There's a few things on there that I, when I, so I, Maybe I will, should shorten your fingers. I will just tell you the story. When I Do was you collect pigeons. No, when I was uh, when I had my wisdom teeth taken out, they gave me uh, sodium pentothal and and Valium, and uh, before apparently, or afterwards, ooh, I want to go to your dentist. <laughs> before <laughs> and apparently, and I don't remember this. I got up after the the surgery and I was wandering around the doctor's office 
asking them for my teeth. I needed my teeth because I wanted to make a necklace. I'd wow. worry if I were you, Matt. Wow. So I don't know. Do I collect body parts? That I don't know. Weird. Wow. Okay. Wow. Well, that. So now we have a definition for creepiness. That is that is actually a really take, cool study. Take pretty that good. to the subway. That's pretty impressive, actually. Because well it's, it's basically saying you there is no definition, but when you see it, you, you know, know it. when you see it. <laughs> right. Well, well, now we have now we have a framework. I like a creepiness that. framework that takes us advanced. Yeah. All right. So hopefully you enjoyed uh, those as much as we did, um, and let's move on to Doctor Gill. So as Listeners of the show also know uh, Chris goes in a completely different direction with The Amazing and Amusing. He tends to focus on The Amazing more than he focuses on The Amusing, though he's had some uh, some amusing ones over the, over the year. Uh, and Chris tends to find ones that are incredibly insightful but take a long time to explain. And for those of you... Uh, who are not here in the studio, which is presumably all of our listeners. Uh, we often have to push Chris to uh, to get to the point on his amazing and amusings, but whenever he does, they're usually pretty brilliant. So here, here are our favorite ones from Chris. I, I found this um, this paper, and I'm going to use the word that scientists often throw around to say they really please, liked it. Please make it not moist. No. Don't say moist. <laughs> elegant. I thought this was an elegant study. Um, elegant. Elegant. And this was a paper uh, published by uh, the, the, the first author was Ho, H-O, uh, senior author Xia, X-I-A, and middle author Chong uh, at the, uh, uh, in Singapore, um, uh, taking advantage of a nas- uh, natural experiment about the effect of taxi color on automobile accidents with those taxis. Um, and the title of the paper- Taxi color? Published in the, in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Scientists of Science. So this was this is a very high That's tier a top journal. Tier journal. It's a top tier journal. Published this just recently, and the title is called "Yellow Taxis Have Fewer Accidents Than Blue Taxis Because Yellow Is More Visible Than Blue," and it took advantage of a natural experiment oh. where two companies in Singapore, one which had a fleet of yellow taxis, merged, and so now you had a combined fleet oh. of a hundred of yellow and blue taxis that were all being driven by the same drivers on a rotating basis, and they had detailed accident statistics on all these taxis and they did a whole series of really excellent controlled analyses and they showed that the, that driving a yellow taxi reduced your risk of being rear-ended by about 9% and it totally that, makes sense and the effect became more profound w- uh, when they these were nighttime accidents and you were relying on ambient street lamps and they controlled for cool. driver experience and age and prior accident history and all of these things none of them mattered except for the color of the taxi and the most profound effect which also was sort of I, I'm not going to use the word biologically plausible, but is was plausible, was that the effect was most profound on, on reducing the risk of rear-end collisions. Um, if you were the taxi that was yellow, you are much less likely to be rear-ended than if you were a blue taxi, That's because cool. you are more visible to the car that crashes into you from behind, whereas front-end collisions, where it's the driver of the yellow taxi, it shouldn't make any difference. The effect was trivial. I thought really? this was a great study. Oh. I think so, we ought to, we ought to expand it. We, totally we ought to cool. use Uber it's and expand totally it to cool. all colors. Oh, and what I really oh, wanted to know is like Uber, Uber doesn't randomize the color of the. You have your driver no. problems. Yeah. It's true. Oh. And, and, and it made me wonder, what, like, what about uh, variations on this where you had like red taxis and green taxis, and like whether with like colorblind men, colorblind, yeah. colorblind men, does that matter? Are red and green cars more likely to to like get in accidents than yellow and, and blue cars? I mean, it's there's so many questions I here. I like it. I like so it I thought a lot. this terrific study. I highly recommend it. PNAS 2017. Chris, I'm going to ask you to go first, and I will. Uh, I will be setting a timer this time to make sure you don't okay. go over your allotted. What is what is it? Three minutes. Three 30, minutes. Thirty-two seconds. Ready. Go. Go. All right. So this this is a, a paper that I found uh, uh, in the British Medical Journal um, yesterday, uh, published in 2018. So it's hot off the press. This is Diana Quirmbach, Q U I R M B A C H, and colleagues. Um, and it's an economic analysis looking at the effect of increasing the price of sugar-sweetened beverages on alcoholic beverage purchases. Yeah, this, uh, this one made the rounds. Yeah, this, this is an interesting an one. one. Yeah. And so, like, for, for, you know, for the, the, the background here is that there's a lot of interest in taxing sugar-sweetened drinks so that you make them expensive and then the people will drink less, you know, Coke, basically, or, you know, sugary drinks. Um, and what they were asking is like, well, is there, a, is there a side impact of doing this? Like, so they're not spent, you know, you increase the tax on, on sugary sodas, but what do they do instead? 
very good question. And, and they did a whole series of interesting economic analyses around this and basically <laughs> found that, you know, obviously the question is quite subtle and it depends on whether you're taxing very sugary drinks or somewhat sugary drinks or diet drinks, which don't have a lot of sugar in them. And it also depends on the income of the people who are being taxed because that changes their, like, you know, if you have tons and tons and tons of money, you may not care yeah. about the impact of the tax. But generally what happened in this cohort, um, which is all self-reported, so this is sort of modeling data, is that if you heavily tax highly sugary beverages, this is data from the United Kingdom, they seem to respond by drinking more beer. This is, this is <laughs> such, such a fascinating... I think that would be a, probably a common denominator for a whole lot of substitution behavior. It's right. such a fascinating <laughs> example of unintending, the law of unintended consequences. Absolutely is. And and to quantify that, this like in this, in this uh, analysis here, they had a drop in like with a tax, it would reduce consumption of, of sugary beverages by like around 0.7%. So it's not a, a huge right. difference. But the increase in alcoholic consumption of beer, lager, cider, or wine was plus 1.57%. So it, it not a multiplier only effect. exceeded, <laughs> not only moved it, but it vastly <laughs> exceeded their consumption of sugary beverages to shifting to alcoholic beverages. Oh, and boy. I just thought that that was like, like you say... You know, the first law of public health is that no good deed will ever go unpunished. Uh, <laughs> so. Oh, boy. What it, what Francois, Francois Fenter, one of our colleagues from South Africa, always says that public health is the, the art and science of making people feel bad about what they eat and, and what, what they eat and having sex. And yeah. I forget, you know, it's one of those things. Of, yep. You know, we just go after one thing and another thing just comes right back. I was um, looking over an interesting paper in the Proceedings of National Academies of Science again and, and found one by authors Ball, Devon, and De Wright. This is a, a group of Dutch, and it's called The Matthew Effect in Science Funding. The, the what now? The Matthew <laughs> Effect. Uh, the Matthew Effect? The Matthew I'm, Effect. So I am, I, I, I am I, locked I in I had here. to look it up. I had to look it up. <laughs> so the Matthew Effect actually goes back to the Bible, to one of the Gospels. Oh, so I'll quote so a few. Matthew mean. 25, 29. It says, For to everyone who has will, more be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So it's a, it's a way of saying the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what this is about. Except this is about science funding and about researchers. Ooh, yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Totally and this agree. is a great one. Go and ahead. so like this phenomenon, like, you know, early success in your career tends to lead to more success and yeah. early failure leads to you know, sort of stagnation of your career not many times. And and so they wanted to sort of quantify this Matthew effect as opposed to like, you know, it's the popular wisdom. They wanted to actually get at it. Yeah. And they had this natural experiment, this killer natural experiment, where like the NIH, they have these early and mid-career development awards. Mm -hmm. Except unlike the NIH, you're, you're, you're granted the award purely on the basis of your peer reviewer score. So there's no like higher council that like, adjusts and says, well, he got a great score, but we hate it and we're not going to fund it anyway. We're going to give the money to this guy with a lousy score. Here, it's straight by the numbers. And so what they wanted to do was to look, to take advantage of this experiment where you have two early career researchers who applied for this award who got almost identical scores, but one was above the threshold and one was slightly below the threshold. Oh, we call that a regression discontinuity. It's a regression discontinuity analysis, exactly. Otherwise, they're, <sighs> they, you would say that they're basically the same, and statistically, those two scores do not differ. Oh my gosh, this is brilliant. And then they followed their trajectory of their research careers, and boy, did it make a difference. Boy, did it make a difference. So when you looked at like, you know, their previous productivity, they were... <sighs> Basically identical. Their their subsequent product, product yeah, yeah. in fact, was almost basically identical. So it wasn't that these were, these were like gunners and superstars who were just like you know excellent researchers. They were about the same as the ones who didn't get the early career development grant. But when you looked ten years, fifteen years in advance in the future, the guys who had gotten the the early career development grants were far far more likely to get the mid career development grants and were fifty percent more likely to become full professors than the other other ones. And their total research funding within ten years that was about three hundred thousand. Dollars, 300,000 euros higher than the ones who had, had not gotten wow. this. So you get so one shot and you shouldn't blow it. Well, that... It's, that, your, first, it's your first care award. It, it was very important. It turns out this is very important. But the, the other part of this was that they, they looked not just at the probability of getting this mere career development grant as sort of like the next capstone of your career, but also the, the application rates were much lower. So the ones who had failed early seemed to kind of like disincentivize and give up and stop trying to submit f for the grant. So their, their, their application rates also plummeted.
common. Oh, that is interesting. So, so it's not a, bias in the system necessarily. It's there's incentive. Some, there's some it's incentive that goes into this. Yeah. And it's like, you know, researchers get discouraged early on and then their, 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 their careers stall. And then it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. Whereas in the opposite, they get that early career to, you know, grants. It gives them kudos. Their chairs yeah. are very happy. You know, their deans are like, blah, That's blah, blah. writing them up on the website. Yeah. And, and suddenly they're like superstars and all the manna from heaven starts to come down from it, just like in the Gospels. That is... It's such a great paper. It's fantastic. I mean, it's both a, a, a really interesting message, but a, what a fantastic uh, use Clever analysis of, of data and analytics. Yeah, I wish I could show Ooh. this, but like this, this is that's the good. this it's is alarming, the alarming though. Boom. I find it really alarming. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's like that's it, a great it's, teaching it's, example too. And if you look at like you know across the spectrum, is not you, you also have the people whose scores were much higher or much lower. Yeah, but within the ones who like were much higher but were above the threshold. Compared with the guys who were just above the threshold, their um, productivity is not different, and so it's like a step function. Yep. You know, it's not it's not a graded productivity. It's all or nothing That's in terms of that early boost. It's it's, it's, it's really rigged. great study. It's really rigged. It's rigged. Really interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, it, read, it rang true. I was like, yeah, I, I can see that. I found this article in the journal PNAS Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences. Got it. <laughs> right. Um, about, uh, it's entitled Nouns Slow Down Speech Across Structurally and Culturally Diverse uh, diverse Languages. Nouns. Nouns. Nouns and are the breaks. Nouns are the breaks in speech. And that's okay. basically the, the theme of this article. And they did it using a very clever set of analyses where they taped people in eight, uh, nine different languages to see if this is a universal effect. And then they looked at the grammatical constructs in their sentences and measured the, the, the amount of time that people like spent trying to state a word uh, as opposed to when they would delay coming up with the next word. And they found that, oh. that the time to, to generate a noun versus a verb was statistically longer across almost all nine languages and that the amount of pauses you put before stating a new word that was a noun was much longer than when you um, had a pause before a verb. Uh, and the, the kind of fascinating thing about this is that, you know, English, for example, has a very large oh, really vocabulary. So there's about, it's hard to, hard to count them um, because what do you, you know, is teriyaki an English word or a Japanese word? This is, you know, like right. where, where do we draw the boundaries between our language and, and words that have been appropriated? But generally we think that English has about half a million words in it. And of those, two thirds of the words are nouns. Um, and about uh, a, a, about a quarter of them are adjectives, and the rest is everything else. And so verbs are actually oh, a very small number. So there's a, there's a there's a very few you know there's a, a relatively small numbers of things that you can do that is to say verbs mm, as opposed to the numbers of things that you can name, which things. is almost infinite. And so oh, that's really it, it's kind of like random access memory where the brain has to like sort of pull in these things which are used very rarely, which are, are nouns, um, and pull them down into a sentence structure. And that takes time, processing time. And that's what they've shown. And they've shown this is a basically a universal effect across all languages. That's pretty cool. It was, it was very cool. It was very cool. Yeah. So as I said, Chris, Chris tends to go in the, uh, in the direction of things that take a lot of explanation. Uh, mine, as listeners will know, uh, tend to go in a very different direction. I'm much more uh, closely aligned with Don in terms of going for the amusing over the amazing, but uh, mine tend to focus on on a couple of different themes. They either tend to hit things in uh, academic publishing that uh, just make me laugh, or they are things that focus on one of my many uh, neuroticisms and uh, poke a little fun at that. So here, here, here are our favorites from the past year that I put forward. For mine, I went back to the uh, the British Medical Journal Christmas edition because it's one of my oh yeah one of my favorites. We love it. Uh, and uh, there's an article from 2000, 2015, which uh, deals with a problem that I find myself dealing with way too often, which is you you do your study and you write up the results, you send it off to the journal for publication, and you get back that letter that says, "We thank you for your submission." Uh, unfortunately, volumes of submissions are high, and at this time, we cannot publish your paper. Thank you very much. The rejection letter, which we all deal with. Uh, and they have come up with a, a pretty great solution to the rejection letter problem, which is called the rejection of rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> and so they've got a letter that you can just fill in the blanks here, and then you, you send this back to the journal, and it goes as follows. So you say, dear professor, insert name of editor, 
Thank you for your rejection of the above manuscript. Unfortunately, we are not able to accept it at this time. As you're probably aware, we receive many rejections each year, and we are simply not able to accept all of them. In fact, with increasing pressure on citation rates and fiercely competitive funding structures, we typically accept fewer than 30% of rejections we receive. Please don't take this as a reflection of your work. The standard of some of the rejections we receive is very high. In terms of the specific factors influencing our decision, the, fa the failure of Assessor 1 to realize the brilliance of this study was certainly one of them. <laughs> Simply stating this study is neither novel nor interesting and does not, extend, does not extend knowledge in this area is not reason enough. This, coupled with the use of Latin quotes by Assessor 2, rendered an acceptance of your rejection extremely unlikely. I will leave it there. <laughs> But I just think that is a, a brilliant concept that we don't need to accept our rejections. It's worth a try. We can reject. Oh, and I will say they, they end it by saying, um, we look forward to receiving the proofs and to working with you in the future. Yours sincerely, insert name here. And then they say, insert university here, insert country here. That is Australia slash New Zealand slash small European country slash Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Makes total Very sense. Good, Matt. Makes I, I total love that. sense. As I mentioned, the peer review process can be quite frustrating. And so there are uh, somebody or a group of people, I don't know, who put together a Twitter handle, a Twitter feed, uh, where you can send in the comments that you get from your peer I've reviewers. Seen this. this is excellent. It's called At Your Paper Sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say I have lost at least three full days of productivity because once you get started, you cannot stop reading these things. And I'm just going to read a few of my favorites. Uh, and I got I to gotta pull it out here because the, the pinned tweet, the one that's sort of at the top from uh, November 2014 says, I'm afraid this manuscript may contribute not so much towards the field's advancement as much as towards its eventual demise. <laughs> okay, so this is another one. It says, this paper is wrong on almost every point, but wrong in interesting and important ways. <laughs> this manuscript in the present form is not a review article, but is rather a number of research papers stapled together. <laughs> the writing and data presentation are so bad that I had to leave work and go home and then spend time to wonder what life is about. <laughs> You need to learn how to think inside the box and stop smoking whatever it is you're smoking. <laughs> and this That's one, gratuitous. That is a little gratuitous. This is my absolute favorite one. Why do you have so many tables? Did you go to Ikea? <laughs> <laughs> my so, reviewers never have a sense of humor. No, they just they insult not. me. No, they do not. Mine, mine just feel angry. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's my goal to get something on there. I'd love to see the responses I that people know. wrote to those. I know. It's, it's got to be absolutely fascinating. Mine actually relates to uh, the topic that we were talking about uh, during the first study, which is this issue of uh, ecologic studies not always being able to tease out the difference between correlation and causation. So as we said with the Uganda study, we have this study which shows really nicely that over time, as the rates of male circumcision go up and the rates of viral suppression go up, the rates of HIV incidents come down. And that's, you know, makes sense to us and it's intuitive and therefore we are, we want to believe that's true. But we have to be careful because we know there are cases where correlation that look really good aren't exactly causation. Spurious. They are Spurious causation, spurious correlation, excuse me. So there is a, it was originally, a, I found it on a website, but it has now been made into a book by a guy named uh, Tyler Vigen. Vi I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, Vegan. <laughs> whatever it is. He's got a very correct So diet. this is, a, uh, this is a, a plug for his book, which apparently you can get on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other sites. Which just looked at a whole bunch of what we presume are, uh, which look to be incredible correlations over time, which presumably we don't actually believe are in fact causation. So let me give you an example. See, so this is a situation where if we had a website, we could post these figures on the website because the figures are really impressive. I think we would link to it. I don't think we're able, but we, we have a website. Do we? We do have a website. That's fun. www.pophealthyx.org. Oh, really? Have you not heard me say that? 
a I, thousand times? I had, but I didn't think, I thought it was static. I didn't think we could actually post yeah. things on so there. So what we've got here is... The, the frequency of you making that statement does not correlate with Don's <laughs> interpretation <laughs> of the... Disagree. <laughs> <application>. Disagree. <laughs> the inverse correlation does not equal causation. No, no, no. Disagree. Perfectly invert, inversely correlated. The more times I say it, the, the less, less likely he is, he is to, to remember it. Because he's stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what these show is graphs over time, so from 2000, let's say, to 2009, and they just plot the yearly values of certain things, and the correlations, just to look at them, you can tell are amazing. I mean, he does actually calculate the actual R-squared values, and they're in the you know 95 for range. Um, so, for example, really good correlation, number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates incredibly well with the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in. <laughs> Certainly must be must be causal. Uh, murders by steam, hot vapors, or hot objects correlates incredibly well with the age of Miss America. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, the number of people killed by venomous spiders correlates incredibly well with the number of letters in the winning word of the script's national spelling bee. No. Incredibly, incredibly Let correlated. That. Let me see that. Yeah, wow. really impressive stuff. So. Wow. My my point Those there spiders, being, let's they, go, are, they are so there's bad. Gotta, there's got to be a connection. I've been saying this there for years. Has to be a connection. What's the what's the uh, yeah? Chris Chris is <laughs> no, national, totally national believe spelling it's bee, arachnophobic. Which is national spelling bee, you know, from the insect kingdom bee. and the venomous spiders, insect kingdom. Ah, there you go. Don has figured it out. Anyway, if you go onto to his website Tyler tylervigan.com or you buy his book uh, there is so many more of these and they are uh, fantastic to uh, to read through so uh, I'm a little late I get it but uh, during Valentine's Day did you guys see the uh, hashtag going around hashtag academic Valentine's no no okay so people were posting academic uh, Valentine uh, uh, what do you call them poems mm -hmm. I'm gonna read a few of them to you this one is from... He's so literary. I am. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm not even going to say who it's from because what does a Twitter handle tell you? But this one is, Roses are red, lilies are blue. This poem was short, but reviewer number three required a number of modifications. So we had to cite, <laughs> we had to cite many of his, poem, his own poems and also change the title of the poem, rephrase the last few rhymes, and replace violets by lilies. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag <laughs> academic valentines. Okay, that was one. That's good. I'll give you another one. Um, this one has a lot of brackets in it, but... I'll just read it as is. Roses are assumed to be red unless otherwise stated. Violets are assumed to be blue unless otherwise stated. This statement on love is tenuous and unquantifiable. Please reframe as an arousal in the hypothesis. <laughs> Roses are red. Violets are blue. What colors are flowers? We can't say. N equals two. Oh, God. <laughs> Roses are red. Correlation isn't causation. If this gets retweeted, does it count as citation? Oh, it should. <laughs> oh, I like it should. I just realized my pathway to promotion at last. But you just said earlier you get your tweets get zero retweets. Oh, so oh that was sorry, that wasn't so early. That was are last. We, aren't we oh. assessed on the number of tweets? I think in addition to the number of publications now at I believe Boston we are University? now. So there I'm you doomed. go. I'm You're doomed. doomed. Sorry. So we hope that you have enjoyed that uh, little slice of reminiscing on the amazing and amusing. We certainly enjoyed it. It's fun for us. And as we've always said, this is our favorite part of the show. So it's fun for us to get a chance to listen back. We hope that you enjoyed it. And we hope you will come back and listen to our next episode uh, when the three of us will be back together in the studio. And once again, we just want to thank all of our listeners for the the sport and for uh, all the downloads that you have been doing in all the countries around the world where we seem to have some listeners. Uh, we hope to uh, put out some interesting content over the next year and we hope that you will continue to listen. Uh, don't forget to uh, look for us on the Population Health Exchange website and you can find us all on Twitter. 